This is JSA TV and JSA Podcasts, the newsroom for telecom and data center professionals. I'm Carl Sketchley, and on behalf of the team here at JSA, welcome to our July virtual roundtable. Over the past few months, we have been running a special series analyzing the effects of the COVID-19 fallout on our industry. Thank you to everyone who joined us on that journey. But as we've all been reminded recently, our industry continues to face the ongoing challenge of safeguarding our network infrastructure in today's rapidly evolving world. For the next 45 minutes, we will come together as one network infrastructure community to engage with top industry thought leaders on this subject. As a little sunshine hopefully at your door today, we provided lunch or if you chose a gift card to a local restaurant for the first 100 registrants. So for those of you who received, please enjoy your JSA lunch while we get started. Just a quick reminder, this is of course a round table. We do want to hear from you and answer your questions. So please go ahead and type them into our question box. Time permitting, we will answer them here. But of course, in the last 15 minutes of the hour, we will be taking our conversation over to LinkedIn for a chat with our speakers. Just search for hashtag JSA virtual roundtables and our feed will come up or click on the direct link that we will be sharing in our chat box shortly. Once there, we will be reviewing the questions that we don't get a chance to cover in the next 45 minutes. So go ahead, post your own questions and thoughts to our panelists there as well. If you have a speaker suggestion for next time or simply to register for our upcoming monthly virtual roundtables, visit jsa.net. Our next one up, we'll be taking a look at top tips for hurricane season network preparedness. That roundtable is August 20th at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Check it out and register. Now, let's get started. Today's topic, safeguarding our network infrastructure in today's brave new world. And for today's chat, we have over 200 registrants joining us. Thank you for your continued support. And thank you as well to our all-star panelists here today. To help us introduce them and to guest moderate, please welcome Jeff Omelchuk, Executive Director of Infrastructure Masons. Jeff, thank you so much for joining us today. The floor is yours. Carl, thanks very much. And I wanted to thank uh, everybody at JSA for making this opportunity available to all of us uh, here. It's great to be here. Uh, it's a sunny, beautiful day and, and things could be worse. Uh, so, um, so thanks so much for having us. Um, uh, and thanks to all the attendees for joining. Um, it's great to have people uh, uh, coming together as a community in these times. Um, I wanna uh, thank particularly our panelists um, and I'll go around and let them introduce themselves in a minute. Uh, let me introduce myself first a little bit. My name is Jeff Omelchuk, as Carl said. I'm uh, one of two executive directors at Infrastructure Masons, the other being uh, my colleague Simon Allen, who's based in London. I'm in Portland, Oregon. Uh, and uh, Infrastructure Masons is an association of people in digital infrastructure. Uh, it's an association of people like you, the builders of the digital age. Uh, and uh, would love to have you all join iMasons. So uh, let me uh, ask our panelists to introduce themselves. I'll, I'll call you out one at a time. Eric, do you want to start? Absolutely. Good afternoon, and I look forward to our discussion today. My name is Eric Dahl. I'm the Vice President of Business Development for Strategic Venue Partners, and we offer wireless infrastructure as a managed service, basically the fourth utility. We manage the entire development process, the initial design system commissioning to monitoring, maintenance, and repairing the system 24-7. We basically fund 100% of your distributed network system. No wireless carrier contributions are required, ensuring time uh, for certainty of delivery. Uh, we have SVP technology. We can do DAS, CBRS, the on-go private LTE network, Wi-Fi, public safety systems, IPTV. So we bring all of our carriers day one. We look forward to the discussion today. Thanks, Eric. Sam? Hi, I'm Sam Reagan. Glad to be here. I'm the business development manager with Colo ATL, which is a uh, data center in downtown Atlanta, as well as uh, we're, Colo ATL is owned by American Tower, and we're also in the process of introducing uh, micro edge data centers into our tower infrastructure all over the country. Thank you very much. Great. Chris? Christopher? 
Uh, Christopher Lodge, uh, Interim CEO and COO for United Fiber and Data. We are a, uh, I'll call it super regional because of the uh, the span that we uh, we encompass from New York City down to the data center capital of Ashburn, Virginia. And we provide uh, both dark and lit services on an alternative uh, route of the I-95 Route 1 corridor. Great. And Suji? Hi, Jeff. Um, thank you for having us here. Um, I'm Sujit Panda. I'm the CTO of BDX. BDX is a data center, pan Asian data center uh, company with assets spread across China. We have two large assets in China. We have a presence in Hong Kong and Singapore, and we are expanding throughout the emerging economies of Asia. Great. Uh, well, a really impressive group of panelists. Thank you all for joining. So I want to kick off the discussion with just uh, you know, a, a personal story. So I, I'm an avid cyclist, uh, and I recently began using a Garmin cycle computer with a radar tail light, which is pretty cool because as you're riding, um, it tracks on your the display on your handlebars cars approaching from behind you. And it's 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 cool and it's amazing and it works really well. I've really enjoyed it. And I went for a ride uh, the other last week actually, and uh, uh, when I got back. Um, it's supposed to sync your ride data to, you know, your profile thing, and it wasn't doing it. Uh, uh, and I, you know, I, I didn't think too much of it, but I heard later that day uh, about the the ransomware attack on Garmin. That was a wasted locker uh, ransomware attack that really took down their entire system. Um, and so my service is back up, uh, but I don't think even quite all of Garmin services are yet up. I understand they actually paid the ransom to get their data you know, restored, and they're still struggling, I believe. Um, so, you know, I use Garmin for recreation, for just rec fitness cycling and, you know, recreation cycling. But they also host services for uh, pilots, both, uh, I think, primarily uh, small plane pilots. They host an, uh, a backcountry uh, wilderness rescue service called InReach uh, that people you know, rely on for their lives. And they have a Garmin Pay system uh, that presumably has credit card information. So, you know, this outage didn't affect me all that much, but man, it could have had real consequences and we may learn that it has, I don't really know. Um, so my first question to the panel, uh, this, this really brought you know, digital security home to me. And my first question to the panel is, you know, has logical security and resilience improved enough to keep hackers out? Are they always going to be ahead of us? Who's beating who here? Uh, let's start with Suji. Do you want to go first? Yeah, I kind of, um, you know, the way I look at this is that you need to look at the attack continuum, right? Saying that um, are the hackers ahead of us, I think, you know, you will never be able to arrive at a, a definitive answer to that, right? So instead of trying to say that I will protect my assets, you have to be prepared for what, what are you doing before, which means how do you protect, right? What do you do if you are under attack, which is during an attack, right? What is the BCP plan that you have, right? So if you just spoke about Garmin, so if there is a ransomware attack, do you have your data protected offsite? Can you, can you actually bring that on and actually isolate the ransomware affected systems? So that's what you do during and what you do after the attack. So what did you learn during this attacks and what was the steps that you took take to ensure that this doesn't happen again? So unless and until you prepare for the attack continuum, you're never going to be saying that I will be ahead of somebody. Things will keep changing. And the pandemic has taught us that, right? So cyber resilience is what I talk about. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where we need to get, get to instead of trying to talk about cyber security only. And, and that's what we're doing in BDX. We're talking about cyber resilience. That's interesting. Uh, Christopher, any comments? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think he's spot on. I think it's uh, interesting, though, that, you know, everybody that's looked at moving to a cloud-based system uh, and how it's made the industry vulnerable, uh, you know, is interesting. Uh, I, I know we look at a lot, you know, what's what, what are the interfaces? How many APIs? You, you start looking at some of these systems out there that are just running, you know, or have the avail uh, ability to run 100 plus APIs into it. And I think it just opens it up. Um, I, but I think as he touched on too, uh, the most important, and I know we talked uh, very briefly before, what can we do to learn from it? 
uh, we don't publish anything about it. Uh, you know, everybody wants to keep it hush hush in the back room that, you know, we got attacked or what our, what our vulnerability is. I think if there was, uh, I, I think Jeff, you had mentioned, you know, an anonymous way to put that information out there and allow others to learn from it. What happened? What can we do to prevent it? Um, you know, and again, as he said, I, I don't think we'll, you know, will we be ahead? Will they be ahead? I, I think it's an ever moving scale. Yeah. Yeah. Sam, do you have any comments on either, you know, uh, who's beating who and who will beat who, or what can we do as a community to uh, learn from each other's mistakes? I think it's hard for us to, as, you know, companies to stay uh, ahead because we have to be right all the time and they only have to be right once, right? They can, you know, continue, continue, continue to attack. They only have to be right once. We have to be right all the time. So I think it's very difficult for, you know, enterprise companies to defend everything all the time. And I think that any uh, CISO that you talk to, it's not if we're going to get, it's when we're going to get. And, you know, what do we do to help mitigate it, like Sujit said. So I think that's really the, the key is, you know, do everything you can to protect, but then what happens when it happens? And you know, I agree, if there was some way to share all this information, that would be great. Unfortunately, I don't think everybody wants to be first. Yeah. You know, some people I hear often about, you know, AI is going to, uh, you know, may, maybe be the ultimate weapon to protect us from these things, although uh, AI will be a pretty formidable foe as well. Um, and we, you know, the, the, the good guys won't be the only ones to have AI. Um, so, Eric, you have any comment on any of this? You know, I agree with the panelists at this point, and, you know, I concentrate a little bit in the healthcare sector, and, you know, the healthcare sector is a very highly targeted sector. And just to give you a couple of stats, in 2016, 27 million patient records were hacked, 5.6 million in 2017, 15 million in 18, 41 million in 2019. I mean, it's just absolutely incredible. And what you don't realize is that it's the second um, – targeted profit center for the black market because of all that healthcare data, which has social security, personal information, phone, and the like. So it's an absolute problem that a space that I'm in all the time absolutely has to get, there, get a hand on it. Do I think we have the upper hand? Absolutely not. Wow, so yeah, being from the healthcare uh, sector, um, uh, that kind of brings us around to, as Carl kind of introduced the panel, one of the focuses uh, is just how the world is different. It has changed so much in the last four months uh, with the COVID onset. Both we were talking before the panel kicked off about you know the economic impacts, but you know there are other impacts as well. As an example, uh, we've driven so many uh, you know people online uh, because it's the only way to interact, and so many of them are relatively inexperienced uh, users. Um, uh, I'd be interested in, in y'all's opinion if, if this presents new challenges for security, uh, just the, the shifting use of the infrastructure. Eric, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, you know, I think one of the things that, you know, there, there's, there's two schools of thought. The one, of course, that my company's uh, most interested in is the infrastructure, you know, on site. And, you know, if that infrastructure isn't updated, no matter what venue you're in, whether in hospitality, healthcare, retail, what have you, you know, it, it sets yourself up for, for security breaches and attacks. And so, you know, I think 5G will be a big help for us uh, from a security standpoint. I'd also put out there that, uh, you know, people have relied on Wi-Fi over the last number of years, and Wi-Fi is definitely not one of the securest uh, architectures out there. So you people just don't realize that, that, that the breaches that happen in the, that space are there. So I think, you know, 5G will definitely help us. And I know that's one of the things that we're targeting from a healthcare, hospitality, educational system in order to bring that infrastructure up to date so that it'll limit the, uh, uh, the, the incidence of it as well as have private LTE as well as carrier LTE service, which is more secure than typical Wi Fi. Yeah, good points. Christopher, what are you thinking about 5G? I, I, again, I mean, we all know 5G is, uh, I'll call it the buzzword of the last uh, two years, uh, uh, for sure. I definitely think it's going to help the industry. We're already seeing some of it. Uh, but I also think it brings a whole new level of uh, physical security. Uh, now we have that many more devices planted out there 
uh, because of the, the densification that we need with uh, 5G radios. So now we're getting into a whole nother level, uh, you know, back to the earlier question that you had, Jeff, on, uh, you know, uh, security in general. Uh, now we got to secure those devices. Uh, we've seen some of the things there's, uh, you know, myths out there about what 5G is doing and things like that. But uh, I'm curious, you know, what the industry around the 5G and, uh, um, you know, DAS and things like that are going to do, is it going to be sensor monitoring, uh, you know, uh, integrated cameras, uh, you know, things like that. I don't think you're going to stop everything, but now we've just taken a city that might have had, you know, 100 vulnerable points to 5,000 vulnerable points within a, you know, within a major city. Right. And that's not going to change, I don't think, uh, with the kind of push to the edge um, I think not only will we see more sensors in the urban environment, uh, as you said, from you know a few thousand to potentially millions, we'll also see more compute infrastructure built out in those environments. If there's a, a, a you know a rack of servers in every Starbucks or Whole Foods, um, what happens to uh, physical security then? Suji, you look you look like you want to jump in. Yeah, that's correct. I, I mean, that's that's I, I come from. A, uh, telecom background, then move to data center. So the way I look at 5G is that, you know, you perhaps, uh, you know, 4G itself, uh, you know, attack the attack, the the number of vectors that you had for attack increased in 4G. Right now, 5G means that what you what you could do in three years, if you were release, if you're getting to a couple of billion devices in three to five years, you in 5G you will get to a billion device in less than a year. So that's 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 what 5G is going to bring us. That's the first piece. The second piece is how do we look at you know the mobile edge. So in the data center industry, 5G will ensure that the edge becomes a bigger growth area than the core. Right. So the core feeds into the edge. Now, interestingly, what it means is for from an attack surface perspective, if I'm I'm somebody who wants to attack, right? It gives me the dimensions that it gives me is 100 times right so so it the, the world will become like i say um, universal security is one thing that we talk about right it will become universally vulnerable so everybody will become so i can actually launch an attack just just if i look at a city i will pick up the least pieces i will pick up the alarm bells to launch an attack right so there's I, i'm no longer looking at laptops to or or mobile phones or ipads to have watch i will look at iot devices to have watch and that means that you know for me to get the get to those numbers i just need to scan you know look at what is happening what's where the vulnerabilities in a in the firmware and get a million devices in a day's time mm -hmm. that's that's what 5d could do to us yeah well sam i wanted to get your your thoughts you you work with uh colo atlanta um, and uh, uh, like Christopher, you guys are involved with uh, 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 5G and towers. And we recently heard of, you know, people burning down 5G towers over concern of uh, God knows what, actually. Uh, but um, I don't know if you have any comment on security in this age. Yeah, so a lot of our tower infrastructure, American Tower, we have, you know, 50,000 towers in the U.S., 180,000 towers globally. A lot of it's in rural areas, so we do have security. We have fencing, we have barbed wire, we have cameras at most of the sites. So we are uh, doing everything that we can to make sure that those facilities are secure. Uh, we're also now building these micro edge data centers at these at the same facilities also, and so that gives us another level of security because there's more cameras. You know, you know, the gate, you know, two factor authentication to get into those and. So we are very more, concerned about the physical more security. infrastructure risk too. If you're, you know, putting more, uh, more assets at the site, yeah. Yeah. So we're definitely looking at. You know, we have 24 by 7 monitoring of those facilities, and we're making sure that, uh, you know, you have to make a phone call to get in the gate, and you have to have two-factor authentication to get into the into the data center. So we're really trying to push the, uh, you know, core data center security out to the edge as well not just the compute and the storage. Yeah, yeah. so I, I want to open it up a little bit um, uh, and just uh, have a, a, a more open discussion about, and, and maybe we start with the topic, 
um, you know, to your mind, what's the greatest risk to the security of digital infrastructure in the next, say, three years? Uh, does anybody want to start the discussion? Um, I would say it's continuing to be what it is now, right? I think that, the, uh, the, you know, especially with COVID, like you said, we've pushed a bunch, all these employees out to the out to their homes and they're not really as security conscious as they were before. And I don't think we've done a good job of locking down all those systems. People are using their personal devices, like we said before, to access their business applications. And I'm not sure all the companies have caught up with that yet. So, you know, I, the phishing attacks and all those things that are going on, I'm assuming are being much more successful today because there's twice as many devices out there being used as they were, you know, six months ago. So I think we're going to continue this I don't see this changing very much in the next two or three years. I think we're going to have to really look at all the security for every single device that every single employee has, whether they're personal or whether they're business. Yeah, and I would I would add to that, uh, you know, Jeff. Uh, I mean, you look at now IT managers, and you know, starting my career in that field, uh, you're not just now managing, you know, your building or your two buildings or the devices on your building you're now managing all the devices that are sitting out there you know so if you have 3,000 devices uh that's fine if they're all con consolidated into a couple buildings but now you have 3,000 devices sitting across 3,000 different networks uh, yeah. i always tell people you know from somebody that's traveled a ton in my career go open your laptop up uh, in a neighborhood and look at the number of networks that list up that you could connect to and I'm still amazed to this day how many are not secure and or they have the security symbol next to it, but how easy it is to really connect to them. Uh, you know, and then one of the things that, you know, uh, um, yeah, as Sam mentioned about, you know, the increase in attacks, uh, I, I read a very uh, interesting statistic. Normally we measure things, oh, that went up 10 percent, 20 percent. Uh, spear phishing email attacks have increased 667% since COVID, you know, not 5%, 10%. I mean, that alone, you know, for an IT manager or a security manager in a, uh, in a corporate environment. And then, like I said, the, the devices now, uh, you know, where, where I'm sitting, you know, I got kids that are doing school or whatever the case may be, a spouse working remotely, all, we're all on the same network. Uh, so I, I think it's going to be real challenging for, uh, you know, the, the IT infrastructure manager. And we've heard for, you know, since the beginning of cybersecurity that actually people are, are one of the biggest risks. And, you know, as, as you said, as we bring more people into using the network, using it from unsecured locations on home computers, uh, yeah, we, we, we are our biggest problem. You know, I think AI will play a huge role in it. Uh, you know, as we discussed earlier, I mean, it's got its own challenges, but I, I think that's going to, uh, I, I don't think it's going to be the savior for it, but I think it's going to help, uh, uh, you, you know, the IT manager uh, or enterprise manager uh, as that progresses. And do you think the good guys can use um... AI to advantage better than the bad guys? And, you know, I, I, when I asked that question, I'm acutely aware, I, I don't know if you read um, uh, Kai-Fu Lee's uh, book about the, uh, the AI race between uh, the US and China. And, you know, one, one source of, you know, bad actor are, um, you know, private entrepreneurs, let's say, uh, but there's also state-sponsored, um, you know, uh, attacks, and some of the state sponsors uh, certainly have uh, very advanced AI and maybe uh, actually ahead of the U.S. as a, you know, as a developed country. Um, so I, I, I wonder what AI is going to do to the security landscape. You know, will it be a net a net help or? Uh, you know, can AI engineer attacks that we are simply incapable of dealing with? It's, a, I mean, it's a good, uh, I mean, it's definitely a good topic. I think if you look back at all the greatest technologies that we've seen, mm -hmm. uh, they're as much of a pro they are, they are a con uh, because it gives other people the same, you know, the same tools. So it, it's, you know, if you would have said to me, 
15 years ago in my career or 20 or even 10, I mean, now you got these things out there, fakes and deep fakes, uh, you know, people creating videos and sound bites that sound like politicians and celebrities and things like that, that, uh, you know, we were going to have to defend against things like that. I, I would have said, you know, you're, you're, you're ridiculous, but I also would have said the same thing about, you know, if you would have pitched uh, TikTok to me, uh, you know, 10 years ago and look where right. that's going. <laughs> yeah. You know, the one comment I'd make on AI is that although it will help both the good guys and the bad guys, it also gives additional access points to a network. So, you know, if you think of all the AI in just a hospital environment, uh, medical facility, you, you name it, it just it just doubles, triples, and quadruples the amount of access points that you know the network can become vulnerable. An interesting stat that I read this morning, which I just was blown away at, that just came out that if you look at the healthcare data breach, it's the most expensive per breach incident at seven million dollars, and it out it, it it outpaces that by ten percent of over last year. I mean, if you think about that and the number of incidents last year, this year or 2019, there were 572 data breaches in the healthcare data industry. Just look wow. at the number, it's crazy. So, I'm not a security expert. I just I just deploy infrastructure that hopefully that works and is secure. Yeah. Well, I think Jeff, one comment that I would want to put ahead. in is that you, you spoke about the fact that what are the three or four big things that, that the COVID thing, when you look at the pandemic, what is part of the four? Uh, one of the things that I think instead of looking at what are the big issues or the big security risks, I look at, you know, what is the solution to that, right? So one of the big things that at least we tell our customers at BDX is because we, we specialize a security solution and, and try to go and tell our customers how do you protect yourself, so irrespective of, you know, this happened, we, we created the product much before the pandemic. But, um, you know, how do you look at identity? At the end of the day, right uh, if you can recognize who's doing what if it is it's a camera that is trying to access a network or if it is a human that is trying to access a network and if it is a human who is he so <clears throat> so our focus to security starts from that so bdx armor that we speak about um we start talking about it in terms of who is the person what's the identity if i can manage the identity of that person that then then and and i use a reputation uh, database to look at the identity, then I think we've looked at 30 to 40 percent of the problem being solved, right? So that's our first focus area, identity. Uh, so I look at that as as among top three solutions to the problems that we're facing. And and we've seen so many uh, jurisdictions, uh, particularly in the U.S. and and but and in Europe, uh, going away from uh, some of the identity uh, based things, facial recognition and other things to understand the identity of people. And and places like like China that have done such a great job of of managing COVID through uh, security means that many in the U.S. as an example would find uh, uh, unacceptable. Uh, I mean that certainly had health implications uh, because we're unwilling to go there. Uh, but again, uh, Kai Fu Lee in his book uh, The AI Superpowers uh, made the point that you know. AI and AI development, uh, the the fuel for AI is data uh, and databases on which to learn. And China is way ahead of uh, of any of the rest of the world in in you know collecting data uh, and feeding that into the you know the AI engine. Uh, I thought it was a fascinating uh, book. And his his you know his conclusion is that, that China is going to uh, you know beat the West in the AI war. Um, and, and he has the background to, you know, have an informed opinion. I thought it was a fascinating book. I don't know if anybody has any comment on uh, on any well, of that and as it relates to security in particular. But. Well, that's an interesting thing. I mean, how do you balance privacy with identity, right? <clears throat> and, and, and when you look at a global company like us, right, uh, how do you look at bringing a reputation and a signature? And, an identity signature with a with a with a AI engine that builds up a reputation, right? And without infringing on the privacy piece, right? So, and that's where uh, we have done some really good work uh, and and created our uh, entire security architecture based on that. 
because because the fact that if you go the China way, you will not probably be able to look at a global customer base. And we have a pretty much you know top names in the industry. Um, so they will not look to us in terms of providing the solutions with respect to BDX armor. If I go and say, hey, you know, we a little bit here and there as far as privacy is concerned, um, that might not sail through. Right? So we're very concerned uh, in, in terms of the way um, identity is used. But there are a lot of ways that you can use the AI, which you brought out very clearly, in terms of looking at an identity signature, which which can be anonymized, and that's where we have specialized in. Hmm. Ah, in interesting. Um, you know, Eric, you've brought out a number of points, uh, you know, specific to the healthcare uh, sector, and I wasn't. Some of the, the 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 sort of level of breach and the impact of breaches in the healthcare sector is. To be candid, a, a little bit of news to me. I'm more familiar with some of the big commercial, you know, uh, breaches that we read about. But what do you think are some of the top challenges that healthcare networks face, um, particularly as a result of the COVID epidemic? Yeah, I think one of the biggest things that that all healthcare networks are are feeling the pain now is you know the distribution of you know all of their remote employees, their laptops, their networks, and it and you've really seen kind of a a lull in the last couple of months, but uh, just yesterday or the day before, uh, Lifespan, which is a system up in uh, Rhode Island, had to pay $1.4 million on one laptop that was disposed of improperly, that was unsecured and didn't have the correct encryption. And so you'll see HIPAA and the Office of, um, uh, who else is doing it? The Office of Civil Rights, Office for Civil Rights, I mean, they're going to start levying some just massive fines, and that's going to catch the attention of these IT directors that they've got to get their houses in line, and if they don't, it's going to be a very expensive lesson to learn, unfortunately. And I just bring up those two examples just because they came up on one of my feeds this morning, and I'm going, well, this is a perfect topic for today. <laughs> and, that's, and that's one laptop. One laptop. One million four hundred thousand. I mean, it's crazy. And I just think, you know, the way the networks are structured, you, you can listen to all, if you go into Becker's or whoever, you see all these CIOs coming out and saying, look, we've deployed all these, uh, all these uh, devices out in the field and we didn't have a choice. Now we're in a, a, a mode of like, uh, did we do it right? What do we have to mop up? What do we have to fix? Uh, you know, it's, it's going to be an ongoing issue from now until a long time. I thought this is Suji's earlier point that is that, you know, I think every IT director is, you know, you know, loses sleep over, uh, you know, what if it happens to me? Trust it. Try, you know, it will happen to you. Right. So, you know, just to develop those plans, what, what do you do then? Have those plans in place. Yeah, it's not if, it's when. I mean, that's yeah. the, that's the yeah. attitude you have to take. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think one of the toughest things that you know we do as a company is to try to convince an IT organization within a healthcare environment that you know hasn't had surgeries going on, so their revenues are falling, they're dealing with COVID, and now all of a sudden it's time to rebuild this infrastructure and they're like, I don't know where to go. But if you don't do it, then you're back in the same situation you were prior to COVID. So, you know, it's damned if you do, damned if you don't. Yeah. So Sam, are there any any anything special in the Atlanta area that uh you know, how are these these challenges affecting you guys? You know, I think that for our Colo ATL business, we've just seen a big influx of customers buying more bandwidth in general, mm. adding more carriers, buying more bandwidth, uh, you know, adding uh, more capacity into their networks that they have. And, you know, I think so, you know, unlike the rest of the economy, we've been, you know, on a kind of a slow, steady growth phase, you know, during this whole thing, which is great for us. but. Uh, I just think that we're going to continue that, and in the American Tower business, the same thing with the 5G rollout and all, and all the new communication infrastructure that's going in. You know, we're uh, continuing to grow during this whole process, so uh, we're probably one of the few bright spots that is out there because just of what we do. You know, at iMasons, we had a, a a set of meetings, global member summits, uh, and the first one was focused on the Americas region, and one of the speakers was. Uh, Noel Walsh, uh, the head of cloud cloud for uh, uh, cloud infrastructure for Microsoft, 
Um, and this, this was April 22nd, so a little early in the pen. It had fully set on, but kind of right, right in the, you know, the 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 upswing, I'll say. And uh, we were talking about um, increased traffic, and she said uh, within Microsoft they had uh, 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 ramped up their capacity by 100 uh, megawatts in two weeks. Uh, uh, increased capacity, and they they were able, you know, her infrastructure group was able to deliver that. I thought, wow, holy cow, you know, to, to change change your base load by a hundred megawatts and pull it off in two weeks, uh, that's impressive. Yeah, <laughs> it's a big it's a big capable team, but geez, <laughs> that's, that's a lot. That's a lot of data center. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> What is anybody else seeing in uh, in terms of just volume increase and and uh, yeah, it's a funny industry to be in this times. So I I hear so much uh, you know pain and economic devastation and then to be in our little bubble of infrastructure here and to see the as you said not only steady growth but but rocketing growth in some ways. I, I you know I think it was April where uh, I read that the the market cap of uh, of Zoom who'd been in business I don't know a, a year or something. And I forgot what the exactly what it was, but it exceeded that of uh, uh, one of the big oil companies, three of the biggest airlines, and you know a few other kind of traditional businesses combined. Uh, it's like in a year <laughs> from you know, of launch. It's like wow, what economic upheaval we're hearing. Jeez, it's incredible. Yeah, Jeff. <laughs> I mean, we haven't seen a ton of change in. Uh, um, traffic we've seen a ton in the traffic patterns mm. so the push versus the pool residential versus the you know the business side obviously residential has gone up you know tenfold where you know business bandwidth has gone down um i i think you know and i'm i'm pleasant i was pleasantly surprised you know knee deep into this and i think a lot of people expected certain things to crash and you know burn to the ground as a result of everybody going home to work and it was quite the opposite. I mean, yes, were there pixelation and some bandwidth issues across different networks? Absolutely. Uh, you know, take the security aspects out of it for now. Uh, but I, uh, I think a lot of people were pleasantly surprised that most networks held their own, uh, just the way the uh, the patterns had shifted. Uh, but it, I think it's going to get a little more interesting now uh, with how that that shift, as I said earlier, you know, with people being home. Uh, and the devices and uh, and this, the the security aspect of it, I, I think that's where it's, uh, it's going to be our biggest challenges over the next 36 months. Is uh, it's definitely on security. I think uh, you know the industry has learned, and I mean there's enough big companies out there. We need bandwidth, like you said, Microsoft. You know, at it, you know, a megawatt upon megawatt. You know, at a, a blink of an eye, uh, we could add capacity. Uh, you know, we just launched a, a lit services network that uh, is capable of 400G. Next year, it'll do 600G. Uh, be able to turn that up, you know, at, at the flick of a, a finger as well. But now I got to secure it all. I, I'm worried, uh, and I made a small, you know, list and you know, preparing for this. Uh, things like uh, I know, probably like a lot of you, I can go on an app on my phone and unlock my car doors, remote start the car. You know what happens uh, as that expands and gets uh, more. The other one that uh, I, I noted: uh, supply chain hacks or attacks. Now, with all this at home, I don't know everybody listening. Probably like my house, Amazon's here quite a bit. <laughs> you know, dropping something off at the door. Uh, again, that's part of that uh, supply chain. Uh, you know, what happens when that gets attacked, or uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, there's a detriment to that industry. You know, the, the FedExes, the UPSs, the DHLs, the Postal Service, uh, down to the uh, the manufacturing side of it. Um, uh, AI, 5G, as we, we talked, uh, down to even, you know, biometric with, uh, you know, my earlier topic of, you know, fakes and deep fakes. How can you now surpass biometrics? So just some points to people to start to consider. Yeah, it's a brave new world indeed. The name of this uh, of this uh, webinar is crazy. So, you know, one of the other things that I wanted to look at is, you know, Chris actually brought it very, 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 uh, you know, pointed pointedly. 
is uh, what's happening on the IoT world, right? So you look at, uh, you know, just look at the data center industry. What we focused on, um, the network is going, you spoke about Microsoft, you spoke about 100 megawatt in a couple of weeks, and that's huge, right? And you're talking about a couple of terabytes of, you know, network bandwidth increase in a data center. And we've seen that, right? So that's a huge amount. Of, so if I look at my Singapore facility, uh, we've got around 11 odd operators out there, right, in the MMR room. We've seen everybody making good money, right? So when we looked at how we run our data centers, we, we, we believe on minimally manned data centers. We use a lot of IoT in our data centers, a lot of automation in our data centers, which means if this is hacked, this entire facility could go down just like that. So how do you how do you ensure that you know you you look at securing all of these, not with the thought that you know it's never going to happen. I I put up the best in place. We look at you know what happens if this part gets hacked. So what's the next piece? So making a fail-safe data center is all about looking at what if this happens, not about you know if you think that I've got it in control. You never get it in control. Yeah. Well, Eric, I want to maybe wrap with uh, to invite you to uh, give us any, uh, you know, wisdom from the healthcare sector uh, in this time of COVID. With uh, I, I imagine not only are the the you know, direct service providers, you know, the doctors and nurses and, and staff under stress uh, in the healthcare sector. And we all, uh, you know, admire their service and dedication. But I imagine the IT side of healthcare is, uh, is stressing right now, too. Uh, any comments there? Yeah, so I've got both personal and professional experiences. My wife is a COO and a CNO of a University of North Carolina health care system here. And so I watch her come home every day mm -hmm. after dealing with just crazy loads of stress uh, based on patients, you know, staff, visitors, what have you. And it's if you haven't thanked a healthcare hero, you better do it because they put up with a lot of stuff that nobody ever sees. It's just crazy. And then professionally, the good news is that hospitals are starting to accept visitors, accept, you know, business uh, meetings. It's still pretty virtual, but, you know, I've got a few things scheduled the next few weeks where I'm actually going to be walking into a few hospitals. And, you know, I've been in the healthcare space for 30 plus years, so it's a space I'm very familiar with and not afraid. And there's a lot of misinformation out there. So educate yourself. That's all I can say. I appreciate the opportunity today. Well, I think we'll let this wrap up the discussion. Let's all uh, uh, thank our healthcare providers and and uh, the frontline workers, and 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 I think our industry uh, deserves to be thanked as well. Uh, we are the the builders of the digital age, and without the work that everybody on this call does every day, um, uh, we wouldn't be having this this you know go to meeting conference, this virtual conference. So. Uh, let's recognize the good work that we all do and, and thank the healthcare workers. So I want to thank uh, Sam and Eric and Christopher and Sujit for uh, joining the panel today. Uh, and uh, Carl, do you have a, uh, a segue here to usher people off to the LinkedIn discussion? Absolutely. Yes. And again, Justin. thank you everyone for your insight and time on uh, spending with us today on this panel. Um, you know, I think it was been a very informative panel overall. Uh, I just want to, you know, once again, shout out to you, Jeff, uh, as Executive Director of Infrastructure Masons for keeping us on point today. And yes, absolutely, our speakers are staying on for the remainder of the lunch hour. We're moving over towards LinkedIn. Just search for hashtag JSA Virtual Roundtables or click the direct link that was placed in the chat box to continue the Q&A. And of course, if you were one of our first 100 registrants, we hope you enjoyed your lunch. Go ahead and visit us at jsa.net to register for upcoming JSA virtual roundtables, including our next one on August 20th, which will be offering tips for hurricane network preparedness. Well, that's a wrap. Um, look out for the playback of today's roundtable.
coming soon to JSA TV and JSA podcasts on YouTube, iTunes, iHeart, Spotify, and more. In the meantime, see you over on LinkedIn. Happy networking. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.